chapter 9. Chapter 9 has the strange name of serial correlation, which is not as strange as the name of chapter 10, which is heteroscedasticity. Um, however, this is a common problem, uh, serial correlation, and so we need to go over it. And this is something that you tend to encounter in time series uh, rather than cross-sectional analyses because in time series there's a natural order to the data. January comes before February, February comes before March, and so on. In cross-sectional there's no specific order that they should have to be in. Alphabetical, okay, height, whatever, um, if you're doing the, the, the uh, um, hours and grade thing. And the problem here is with a time series uh, where you would have serial correlation is with the error terms. And let me look at this real quick. Yeah. Time. You know, big number, small number, zero. So this error term, oh, I probably shouldn't subscript it sub i here. Eh, I don't need a subscript at all. It's just a label. Um, the uh, error term should average to be zero, right? As you may recall from uh, an earlier, I guess from chapter four. And furthermore, uh, if it doesn't have a mean of zero, then the intercept takes care of it. So I don't have to worry about that. What we're worried about in this chapter is, is there a correlation among the error terms? Do the error terms look like this? So they just seem kind of random. I mean, they kind of average out to zero. They better average out to zero. They average out to zero, but they're, they're kind of random. Or do they look like this? They average out to zero, but there's a very clear pattern. That's a problem. That's a violation of one of the classical assumptions. And what it's going to tend to do is it's going to cause, let's see what we got here. Um, the uh, estimates are not biased, but it gives you artificially inflated T-scores. And I think the easiest way to understand that intuitively is the computer gets all excited. Oh my God, a pattern! Well, I know what the hell's going on here, right? Uh, that it, it reinforces the, the computer's um, confidence that it has come up with, a, with an important relationship when in fact, actually it's just a problem with the data. Um, and let me first, before I go into that further, give you an example of how this might happen. Um, let's say you had a, a, a regression built to explain unemployment in the United States, right? So you've got, Unemployment is a function of beta sub zero plus beta sub one, all these variables. You probably didn't include COVID-19. And the problem is that COVID-19 is not something that you would normally include in the regression. It is a, a, a random shock uh, to the system and a random shock that will have lasting effects that won't just be one quarter. Even if it happened and then we cured it in one quarter, uh, there would still be a lasting impact for quarters after that. So that your regression here built around the idea that the economy is not experiencing some sort of random external shock, but is in fact being, uh, being sort of a, a calm period where internal forces, endogenous forces are driving unemployment. When there's an external force like COVID-19, it doesn't just impact in the first quarter it happened, it then has a lasting effect until the economy can eventually recover several quarters later. That causes the errors to be correlated. That your, your unemployment uh, formula is going to underestimate unemployment when COVID-19 happens because it's going to be this huge external effect. It's going to underestimate the impact of, or it's going to underestimate unemployment because it doesn't take into account this, this weird external factor. And it's not going to take it into account next quarter and the next quarter and the next quarter when the economy has this big collapse in employment and then slowly recovers. The, the regression is going to be underestimating unemployment for a number of uh, quarters in a row so that uh, your, your regression underestimated and it's taking it a while to get back to average. Or what's the, what's the, what's the, what's the, what's the, what's a positive um, a boon 
on employment like we discover some new technology and all of a sudden there's a big jump in employment but then we incorporate the technology and it's not such a big deal anymore we're going to have a, 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 an underestimate of what unemployment is so very common in time series and again the problem is when the error terms are correlated which they're very possibly could be especially in a macro model here's what uh, uh, the author says Time series have some characteristics that make them more difficult to deal with than cross-sectional. One, the order of observations in a time series is fixed, all right? So there's a specific order to things so that if there is a pattern like this, we can create a pattern like this out of the students and the grades. We can organize the data so that all the underestimates are over here and all the overestimates are over here and so on, but we just made that up. There's no natural order. Here there's a natural order. January, February, March, April, or first quarter, second quarter, third quarter. So the order of observations is fixed. Time series samples tend to be much smaller than cross-sectional ones. Think about this. What if you were doing a, a time series of someone's grades in a class? You're going to have like five observations for exam, maybe 10 for quizzes, something like that, as opposed to a cross-section of all the intro micro students in fall, whatever, and I, uh, I can't remember what I told you before, how many that would be, 300, 400, 500 students. Oh wow, you get this huge sample size. So sample sizes with time series tend to be smaller. The theory underlying time series analysis can be quite complex. Think about this trying to explain how a person's grades change over time as they try, you know, uh, different methods and so forth, as opposed to just a snapshot of all these people at once and how they study differently. Uh, the, the development of, of, of uh, uh, adjustment uh, in a class is a more complex process to explain than just the difference among the students, right? So that, that's the third one. Let's see, yeah. And the fourth one is uh, that the stochastic error term in a time series is often affected by events that took place in a previous time period. Voila, exactly what I was talking about. Now, uh, before I go into this further, just like in the last, uh, was it in the last chapter? No, 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 we're going to do it next. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. In, in the previous one, we had perfect and imperfect multicollinearity. Here we've got pure and impure serial correlation. And... I think we're going to deal with impure, I'm sorry, with pure first, because impure is fairly straightforward. Hang on, I just typed this yesterday, and now I'm forgetting which order I did it in. Yeah, that's right. And we're going to do pure serial correlation first. Impure is going to have been caused by a uh, specification error. You, you, you specified your regression incorrectly. And the reason why you're getting the pattern is you left out some variable. You left out some variable that would have explained the uh, you know, underestimates here and overestimates here, and they would have gone away, and it would have looked more like the red one. So impure is you just left a variable out. And the pattern is from that excluded variable. That excluded variable is what would have explained these uh, green dots in a manner that would have made them look like the red dots. But let's go into first here uh, the pure serial correlation, which is the bigger problem. I mean, obviously the solution for impure is to fix your regression, all right, to, to make sure uh, that you actually ran it correctly. Um, and we'll get to that eventually. All right. Now, it's kind of a hard concept to understand in some ways, but fortunately it's not that hard to test for or, or relatively easy to correct for. Uh, so, here is the most common form of serial correlation. This is equation 9.1 in the book. Is equal to, I believe that's rho. Why do we use Greek letters? Because it looks really cool. Okay, here's your error term. What if error term from this time period is somehow correlated with the error term from the previous time period? That is uh, first order serial correlation. And you can have, or, or t minus two or t minus three can be quite complicated. Uh, we at least start off in class talking about first order. I don't think we're gonna talk much about second order. Uh, and let's see, if, if rho turns out to be zero, we got no problem. Oh, I'm sorry, this is a random error term at the end. This is also a stochastic error term. Uh, so it's a stochastic error term explaining the stochastic error term. And if rho is zero, not sure what the dog wants, 
uh, then the stochastic error term is simply random. All right, so if that's zero, it's simply random. If we got something that is significantly greater than zero, then we have positive serial correlation, which is what I showed you on that graph a moment ago. Less than zero, negative serial correlation, which we're not really going to talk about because that would be when you have an error above the line, it tends to cause an error below the line, which tends to cause an error above the line like that. And that really doesn't happen in the economics. There may be some uh, unusual circumstances of which I am not aware, but that's why you do a literature review. You find out from other researchers whether or not this is an issue. Generally speaking, 99.9% .9 of the time, we're worried about things like I explained a minute ago with the COVID-19, where there is this lasting impact of uh, the... Um, on the unemployment that goes past one quarter. Uh, so the fact that unemployment was unusually high in period T minus one was also unusually high in, T in, T in uh, period T uh, and, and so on. So there's this, there's this uh, connection. Um, it doesn't mean this one's causing this one because that's not really how this works, but it means that when this one is negative, this one also tends to be negative. When this one's positive, this one also tends to be positive. And of course here I'm referencing that one. Uh, negative, it would have been switching signs. All right, so that's the simple background of it. And it turns out th there's an easy way to test this. Is that where I'm up to now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that, that's really all there is to it. Are the error terms related to one another from one period to the next and uh, in a positive or negative way? Well, we're not going to worry about that. We're going to hope for this one. Sorry, I'm terrible at art. That's supposed to be a heart. We're hoping for that. Uh, and we're going to test to see if this is true and to see if, in fact, our uh, T-scores are artificially inflated and all kinds of crap like that. Uh, so, I think I'm ready to go on to the test. Well, let me show you a couple of pictures here from the book. Here's figure 9.1. Those are examples of positive serial correlation. Uh, then you can see that they're following each other. The second one is kind of what I showed you on the, on the whiteboard there a minute ago, the first one. Um, first one feels more like it would be if we're looking at a period uh, like with the COVID-19 where um, the uh, unemployment was, was uh, um, lower than expected or employment was, I'm sorry, unemployment was higher than expected or employment was lower than expected. Uh, and this, this lasted for a, quite a while even though there was only one shock. Um, then here's an example of no serial correlation. And he's got a couple in here of negative. They're just kind of bouncing back and forth when one's above the line, the next one's below and so forth. This one's not quite as tight, but it's the same sort of thing. Um, and as I said, uh, we don't really encounter that much in economics. He also gives an example. Uh, it, can take on, it can take on many forms other than first order. Here's one uh, for quarterly that it might be related to the, what happened this same time uh, last year in the same quarter. So it's related to something four time periods ago. Uh, this one here. Wait a minute. That would be three time periods ago, wouldn't it? Oh, no, no, no. That, that, that's right. Yeah. All right. So I was trying to figure uh, if today, if T is first quarter, T minus 1, T minus 2, T minus 3, T minus 4, uh, second, third, I'm going backwards here. Oh, I'm sorry, I should go in this way. 4, 3, 2, 1. No, he's right. How not surprising that the author of the textbook is correct. Um, and then also, uh, it may be a function of one or more of the previous periods, which is a real pain in the neck to detect, um, although we have some methods. Now, uh, then there's the section in the book on impure serial correlation, which, as I already told you, could be from omitted variable. I, forget, I didn't think to tell you about incorrect functional form. Um, check this out. It could be that and this is impure. I've skipped over to impure before I start talking about the method to detect serial correlation. And the reason for that is, is there's no point in trying to detect something that you look and say, oh, wait a minute, I just didn't specify the regression correctly. So let's get that one out of the way first. You, you get impure out of the way first. And if you estimated, oh, let's say uh, this line right here, 
when in fact the real world relationship looks more like this, well, guess what? There's going to be a pattern to how far off uh, your, your um, points were from the regression line. And so you've just specified the wrong form. So the very first thing you want to do when you think you have serial correlation is to think, now, wait a minute. Are these the right variables in the regression? Have I omitted something? And uh, barring that, do I think I have the right functional form, which, of course, was covered in the previous chapter? All right. Now I think I'm on to wanting to talk about, yeah, it doesn't cause bias. Uh, the um, OLS is no longer the minimum variance estimator, and the uh, OLS estimates tend to be biased, tending to uh, create uh, un, un, um, uh, unreliable hypothesis testing. Okay, here's the test. Now, I'm going to go into some detail on something called the Durbin-Watson test, the test for serial correlation. And uh, it's not as popular anymore, all right? Uh, in fact, in the paper I've been showing you, I actually used a Broish godfrey uh, uh, test. And, um, but the, the Durbin Watson's easier to explain. And so, and it also makes use of that row I was talking about in a very direct manner and, and in a very intuitive manner. So I want to explain that to you. And I have, I have some homework where you have to do a Durbin Watson test. So I'm going to give you a, a test here that is covered in great detail in the book, but I'm not sure is used as frequently anymore. Uh, but it's an easier one to explain for class. And the Durbin Watson test is used, that's what time it is here, uh, is used to determine if there's first order serial correlation. Now, uh, in order to do it, your regression must include an intercept term, but generally speaking, we say you should do that. Uh, the serial correlation needs to be first order, so it's related to the immediately previous error term. And it can't include a lagged dependent variable as an independent variable. There are some regressions where they do... They'll include, I'm sorry, that's a minus. They'll include a dependent variable as one of the independent variables on the assumption that, uh, let, let's say this is, this is uh, trying to predict or trying to explain a company's inventory. Well, your previous inventory is going to have some impact on, how, on what your inventory is in the next time period. Uh, the, if you've, so there's legitimate reasons to do this. But if you've done this, you can't use the Durbin Watson test anymore. And quite honestly, from 30 years ago, when I took the class on all the theory behind this, I can't remember why. But turns out that you don't need to remember why as long as you don't do it. All right, here is the equation for the Durbin Watson statistic. And the computer will just spit this out for you. I'll, uh, I think I've got the commands typed in here somewhere. Yeah, the, there they are. Yeah, okay. Uh, I've got the command typed in there for you. But, but it'll do this for you. But this is where it's coming from, and I think it's kind of neat to see this, to see what the uh, um, test statistic looks like. Oh, that's a much better pen, isn't it? Is that right, Jen? Yeah. Um, now that's the sum from uh, the second observation to the total uh, number of observations. That's the sum from the first observation, but you don't need to know that. That's not particularly relevant. Um, the reason this has to be from the second one is because you can't subtract one from another uh, until you're up to the second observation. But that, again, it's going to calculate it for you. Now check this out. If we had let me write this row thing down here again. Uh, and, oh, and by the way, uh, I'm not writing this anymore, right? Because I can't test this. We don't have these data. We don't have the stochastic error term, but we do have the residuals. So what we're going to do is we're going to test the residuals to see if there might be a correlation among them, uh, which we're assuming, um, which, all, which is going to be the cause of, of the serial correlation. So, but let me go back to that original equation. Now remember, if we got a zero there, fantastic. There's really no serial correlation. The stochastic error term is simply random, all right? 
But if we've got a positive number here, then there's some positive correlation between these two. When the error is above the line, it tends to stay there. When the error is below the line, it tends to stay there. It's still going to be zero on average, but it's going to be correlated. Um, sorry, I'm checking my watch here. I have a department chair's meeting uh, at 3.30, which is in about uh, 40 minutes from now. All right, uh, and if it's negative, then we have extreme negative serial correlation. Okay, well, uh, think about this for a minute then. Uh, you've Remember, we don't have the error terms, but we do have the residuals. We can test the residuals to see if there's a relationship or not. And, and, and if there's an extreme positive serial correlation, extreme positive, then that would mean that every one of these is identical to every one of these. Obviously, that can't really happen because they still have to average to zero. But if rho is equal to one, you've got extreme positive serial correlation. If rho is equal to negative one, you've got extreme negative serial correlation. And look what would happen to the numbers, all right? If, if uh, let's see, I'll write this in, ah, let me change the color of this so I can illustrate this up here. Rho equals negative one, okay. Uh, if rho were equal to one, then think about what this re regression or what this uh, equation, what this fraction is going to be. If rho is equal to one, then every et is equal to every et minus one. Every one of these is equal to every one of these. So what's the numerator? Zero. So in a case where rho is equal to one, this Durbin-Watson statistic is equal to zero because the numerator would be zero. If we had extreme serial uh, positive serial correlation, then every one of these would be identical to every one of these, therefore the numerator is zero. So the Durbin-Watson D statistic, which is what you're calculating here, would be equal to zero. Again, the computer does it for you, but I want you to see the background. What if every one of these uh, was equal to a negative one of these? Because right, that's negative one. Rho, uh, if th it says if every one of these was equal to a negative one of the ones before it, then what have you got? Well, let's say it's one. All right, one minus a negative one is two. Two times two is four. Extreme negative serial correlation, we're figuring is going to be around, uh, is going to be four. Extreme negative serial correlation. Again, because in the previous example, uh, if, you've got, if you've got one, for example, well, any, this minus anything that's the same thing is going to be zero. So uh, when rho is equal to uh, one, then those two numbers are equal, and then we have a zero up here. When rho is equal to negative one, then uh, what we end up with is these being the opposite of each other. And so let's say, I don't know why it works out to be exactly uh, uh, one, but it is. Um, so we've got a four. So what's in between? Let's see, let me write this in big orange. What's in between That's not a terrible heart. D equals two means that we don't have uh, any um, positive serial correlation or negative serial correlation, that they're basically uncorrelated, all right? So what we're, at what we're hoping for is, it's easy to explain the endpoints on this one. So I like to do this particular test because you can explain uh, fairly simply what the endpoints would be. So the D statistic can't get any smaller, I'm sorry, can't get any, uh, yeah, smaller than one or, or bigger than, than four. Uh, and so what's right in between is two, and two is what you're hoping for. It's not going to be exactly two, but something close to two. Uh, so, let's see. Now, yeah, we've got extreme positive serial correlation, D is equal to zero. Extreme negative D is equal to, uh, to about four. Uh, and see, he uses, this is very useful, by the way. I should point this out if you've never seen this before. If you do a squiggly equal sign, it means, eh, it's about that. So, uh, in your math classes, you might be able to get away with using that with some frequency. For example, 2 plus 3 is about 6. You know, it's about 6, all right? Hey, there's nothing wrong with that. How can someone mark that wrong? I suggest that you use that with some frequency in your math courses when you're not quite sure of the answer. All right, so let's see here. We almost never bother to test 
in econometrics for negative serial correlation. All right, so it's almost always positive serial correlation. Uh, in your homework, it's going to be nothing but positive serial correlation. And, and here's how it works, okay? Uh, there's a couple of steps to it. And you're going to have to do this on a couple of the, uh, of the homework assignments. Uh, let me show you first how to make the computer give you these D statistic numbers. Uh, let me see where I type this up. Uh, there it is, okay. In Durbin Watson, I'm sorry, in, in Stata, type this. Time series set. You're telling Stata that this is going to be a time series. Space, and then the variable that you used for your uh, um, T column. If it's months, if it's quarters, if it's years or whatever, let's say it was years. Let's say you, let's say you had a column called year. T set space year. Click. And it won't have done anything, but it told the computer, oh, this isn't a cross section, this is a time series. And it's, it's organized by this column over here. Okay, fair enough, right? The next thing you do is you want to run your regression. So type in reg and then whatever your regression is. Then you type this. Estat uh, space DW. Oh no, Estat space D Watson. Estat space D Watson, and it will give you the, D, the Durbin Watson D statistic stuff. And I'll, and I'll show you uh, more specifically when I go over the homework which I'll do in a, in a separate video. I decided not to mix those together in case I use these videos later uh, and why I wasn't assigning the same homework, so I'm going to separate those two out, but that's what you're going to do. All right, so uh, what you end up doing then is when you get that number, when you get that number, then, and I'll show you how to do this on the uh, homework, again, on the uh, premise that I might not end up assigning this uh, test one day, but you're going to look up on it. Well, here, let me show you the table. The Durbin watch, and again, he does a great job on this because he includes the explanation. I don't know if you remember this from before, but here's table B4. There's all the Durbin Watson numbers, which I'll explain in a moment. He reminds you how to do it. And I'm going to tell you, a lot of econometrics books make you look back in the chapter to remember again how you do this thing. He goes through the whole thing all over again. Fantastic book. All right. Expensive, but honestly, it's so much better. All right, so uh, let's say you're doing a Durbin-Watson 5% um, one-sided level of significance, which I believe is all we do in, in, in this book. And one-sided means we're only testing for positive serial correlation. We're assuming there's not going to be any negative, so we're only testing for positive serial correlation. And so the null hypothesis here, hey, let me check something. That's interesting. I think I just noticed a difference between this and the book. No, no, no. It must be somewhere else. Okay. Um, your null hypothesis is... Oh, I'm sorry. That rho is less than or equal to zero, which means no positive serial correlation. Your alternative hypothesis is going to be that you do have it. So we're setting this up a little bit differently than we, than we normally do with, say, a t-test. Uh, we're hoping not to trigger the alternative hypothesis. We normally hope to. We, we normally hope to reject this up here, but this time we don't. We hope it's true. We hope we can't reject the null hypothesis, because the null hypothesis is what we hope is true, and that is that there's not serial correlation. Now, when your computer generates the number for you, and let me make one up here. Uh, let's say we found out that the Durbin-Watson D statistic was 1.4. All right. Now this is an interesting table here because for every one of the data points, uh oh, dang it, I'm running out of time. Uh, if I stick to my half hour thing, how much further have I got to go? If I just kept on talking, perhaps that would take care of everything. Actually, we're about done, so I'm just going to push on here. Um, so uh, on this table, you get two values. 
Uh, and first, you need to know the number of observations. That's over here on the first column, number of observations. So not degrees of freedom, just the number of observations. Then across the top, the k equals 1, 2, 3, 4. That's the number of explanatory variables that your regression had. So let's say we got a 1.4 uh, and we had, uh, I don't want to pick something that's not on the, on the thing, 36 observations and k equals 3. Three explanatory variables in our regression. So now let's look up the 5% one-sided level of significance uh, for 36 observations and three explanatory variables. 36 3, 1.3, 1. 1. Oh, interesting. 1.3, 1. 1.65. 1.30, 1. 1.65. Okay. It gives you two numbers. All right. It always gives you two numbers, an upper and a lower. Focus, focus, focus. Come on. There we go. An upper and a lower. Right. Um, and the way it works is, if you got to remember, you don't want zero, right? You're hoping not to get zero. So you want something above zero. Um, so if it's above 1.65, it's like, yeah, yeah, you don't have a problem. Don't worry about it. If it's above 1.65, don't worry. Be happy. If it's below 1.3, though, it's like, yeah, you got a problem. Uh, that if it's, if the, and ours was 1.4 uh, that I made up there on the spur of the moment. Ours is 1.4, so it's not above 1.65. So we can't say, Good, we did not reject the null hypothesis of no serial correlation, nor is it below 1.3, which would um, make us reject the null hypothesis. It's in between. That's called the inconclusive range. That's called in that range, you can't really make a call. All right. Uh, why a statistical table has an inconclusive range, I don't exactly know. Uh, I don't remember that from class years and years ago, but there is such a... So in, in that case, you're left as the researcher like, well, uh, it was in the inconclusive range. I don't know what to tell you. Uh, I, you know, and you can do something about it. You don't have to do something about it. If you did do something about it, and here's where we're going to finish up here. If you did do something about it, what could you do? Well, there's a couple of options, and I'm not going to go over these in any detail. Um, oh, hang on. Let me do another video.